So we are now officially recording this session. Um, and you might note that I have been noting that I'm muting folks' microphones as we go. Um, and that's just a, a, as a courtesy to all the other listeners and so that we don't pick up a lot of background noise. So only the speaker at any given time will be allowed to talk unless we open for questions. Um, so today's topic um, is in celebration of International Open Access Week. Happy Open Access Week, everybody. Um, and the theme of Open Access Week this year is open in order to, and then whatever you want to put behind that. Um, and so I got really excited in that idea, so we're going to run with it for this webinar. Um, to give a sense of what we'll be doing, I'm going to do some brief introductions. We'll talk about what CCCOER is and what we're working on this year. Um, and then we'll hear from our two speakers on Affordable Learning Georgia and OER enabled course shells, which are very cool. Um, and then we'll talk about kind of staying in the loop. We're gonna save all the questions to the end unless we can interact in the chat window. Um, and as Una said in both chat and briefly in that speaking, she is our tech support for today. <laughs> So Una is going to help monitor the chat window um, and stay connected with everybody. Um, okay, so first I want to give our two presenters a chance to both test their mics again one more time, but also um, um, introduce themselves. So um, Jeff, would you mind just saying hello? This is Jeff Gallant, Program Manager for Lo Affordable Learning Georgia. Hello, this is Jeff Gallant, Program Manager for Affordable Learning Georgia. <laughs> and Barbara Olowski, would you mind joining us um, oh. just to test your mic? Hi, everybody. Barbara Olowski. I'm excited to be here. And um, I also have a lot of my team members here from the project I'll be sharing. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Uh, some brief introductory slides here about CCCOER and what we do. Um, another thing that we're celebrating right now is our 10th anniversary. This is the 10th year of CCCOER. Um, and our mission, it's an ongoing mission, is to expand awareness and access um, of OER to support faculty choice and development in open education and improve student success. Um, and we do that through our community of practice, through these webinars, through um, meetups at conferences and through presentations. So we do that all over. Um, okay. Um, and we are a community of practice and consortium that is in 25 states. Um, we have eight statewide consortiums and members all over. You can see that we are growing our membership and we're very excited to keep doing that. Um, so if you are attending for the first time today and you would like to know more about membership, please see our website at cccoer.org. Um, and so to talk a little bit more about what inspired this week, this um, webinar today, um, it is Open Access Week and um, there is a connection between open access and OER and sometimes it's um, tenuous and sometimes it's really strong and I think we need to celebrate and support that. Um, I think one of the things about open access and OER that is really closely tied together is the idea that when we share something it ripples throughout the entire community. When we share a resource um, it ripples and supports other people's work and supports the adoption of OER and one of the things that open access really stresses and supports heavily is teaching people about their choice around copyrights and open li openly licensing works. So I think that's where our two movements are very closely tied together. Um, and so this webinar is really focusing on two projects that focus on sharing and talking to people about how they share their materials. So I'm really excited to have our two speakers today. Um, and I'd like to start just um, doing a brief introduction and then I'm learning Georgia. He's an advocate for librarians in open education. Um, and I just noticed today <laughs> that he is one of the lead authors or supporters of a new 
kind of promotional project development tool called OER Myth Busting. And it was shared by Spark, um, a, an international leader on open access, just this morning. So thanks, Jeff, for that. And um, if you'd like to take over the slides, I will happily give it up. OK, thank you very much for having me. Um, I, I'm from the University System of Georgia. And if you know the USG, then uh, the context of everything I'm going to say makes total sense. But you may not. And so the USG is not the technical college system. That is where um, they, they had just recently joined the, uh, the CCC OER. Um, we are the uh, four-year institutions from the state college uh, level to the research classification level within the state of Georgia. Um, there's 28 different institutions. So the biggest uh, mistake people make is saying the University of Georgia system. All of these institutions do not belong to UGA. They are all under one roof and one state agency. Um, and you can see here that we have quite a bit of students, uh, a ton of enrollments per semester, and if we can get something done uh, within the University System of Georgia, it's at a gigantic scale. Oh, we are getting some transitions here. I'm going to go back. There we go. Um, also, a, a need to know type of thing, what Galileo is. Galileo is Georgia Library Learning Online. It is our statewide virtual library. It's been going for over 20 years. And we've been affordable uh, for those 20 years. We've been leveraging the idea of a state consortium to let libraries across the state have resources that they usually wouldn't be able to pay for. Um, so Galileo is what hosts our initiative, Affordable Learning Georgia. But before we existed, way back before we existed, about 14 years before we existed, we were trying to share online course materials. Um, back in 2000, uh, when, when you know, Y2K was happening, the internet was just coming out of its let's dial into America online phase, um, the USG was looking at creating online core curriculum courses, um, the gen ed courses that everybody has to take throughout the system. And they thought if they could get all of this online, it would be shareable and it would be a lot more affordable. And this became Georgia's online core curriculum known as eCore. In 2002, those courses got created. Um, it took quite a bit of time. And immediately we wanted to share those courses across the system to faculty who weren't in eCore teaching an eCore course. We thought, these resources might be helpful to faculty members who want to use these um, possibly to replace a textbook, but at least for course design um, reasons. And so the USG Office of Faculty Development, which deals with all uh, faculty training throughout the state, uh, they host the teaching and learning conference each year, uh, they host faculty learning consortiums and science of teaching and learning groups, um, they assisted with the process of sharing these courses. In 2003, they went even further. They thought, what if we could take all of these eCore materials and um, sort of unbundle them from the course itself and share them throughout the USG, uh, making this sharing even more efficient. So they were breaking down these eCore materials into what we called learning objects. Um, and if you are part of the open education community for a long time, uh, learning objects are kind of that, that old term for what we now know as OER because we are adding a lot higher degrees of openness to things like that. So in 2004, we created a digital repository. It was called USG Share. Um, the idea was to have a server that we hosted um, that would be a shared server throughout the state and we could support effective teaching through sharing these resources. Um, and we could even possibly enable faculty to share them um, at the same time, to share, to share their own. Um, there was 
because of this, we finally had a single point of access instead of just one institution sharing um, within one place. Of course, it was a password protected repository, so it was a little different from what we would see as OER these days. Uh, this is what you would see when you went to USG Share. And if you needed to know yet another username and password, that wasn't going to work very well, uh, especially when it came to just how easily you would like to share these files and link them out to people. But USG Share did get used and we started moving toward a type of open education. Um, USG Share started adding more learning objects from other repositories that were OER, um, working with the CSU and Merlot. Uh, open textbooks started getting linked there. So we started out uh, with this repository and now it was also becoming a referatory. Uh, it was becoming kind of a statewide Merlot. Uh, it wasn't getting used enough though. And in 2011, the cost of maintaining USG Share and the platform were just too high considering how much usage it was getting. Um, so that server was decommissioned and USG Share ended in 2011. Um, they moved the funding from USG Share that was currently existing into creating the first USG open textbook of its own. So we're moving at this point from just a platform for sharing to creating new content um, that could be used by not just the USG, but by everyone. Um, because of this, our attitude towards statewide repositories was a bit soured because of this experience. And I feel that many states tended to go through this around 2011 to 2013. The idea that if you build it, they will come wasn't panning out. Uh, you, you definitely saw that in places like Florida who had their own statewide repository and encountered those same types of issues. Um, USG Share was one of those. So we were trying to find non-repository solutions at this point. So in 2011, we started making an open textbook and we were working with the University of North Georgia Press. We were developing a process and a workflow, kind of a proof of concept of how to make an open textbook within the university system of Georgia through one institution's university press. Um, we started in 2011 and it was published two years later in summer 2013. It was a successful effort and therefore it got integrated into what would become Affordable Learning Georgia. And we had a collaborative model sharing work across the state. There were faculty authors at different USG institutions. The university press was kind of binding it all together. We had instructional designers from across the state looking at how this would work. And we had project managers because creating a, an entire open textbook is a lot of work. Um, and it was hosted on their site, uh, on the University Press of North Georgia site. This worked okay, but visibility was a bit of an issue uh, for them, and the idea of long-term hosting was kind of tough. Well, we had a new focus on textbook costs starting around 2014, and I'm sure if you're part of the CCC OER that you've seen these numbers before. These are the 2016 version of the Florida Virtual Campus numbers. Our state was looking at things like this and going, how can we improve retention? How can we improve student success, student performance, and how can we equalize uh, educational resources in the classroom, at least create equity? Uh, so we started Affordable Learning Georgia in 2014 and 2015, or would be that fiscal year. Um, our idea is to have opt-in programs, um, not telling faculty this is what you're going to teach with, um, and raising awareness of OER, the idea being that if they know it, they will come. Um, by funding their time, we are, we've reduced the barrier for them to participate. Uh, time is, has been the biggest problem for faculty both within um, within the National Babson Survey Research Group survey and within our own survey of applicants for textbook transformation grants. Uh, I've got a question that says, was that title history in the making and can we get the slides after? Thank you. Yes, and I believe yes, that that is up to uh, the hosts, but I am sure that they are going to be sharing these slides. 
and yes, that was the title. It, I can even give you the repository link to that open textbook. And I am just grabbing it for you right now. And there it is. It is our first history textbook in the new repository. Um, we wanted to also make sure that we had a community of practice, people who were sharing their experiences and letting faculty not have to reinvent the wheel every single time that someone wants to implement OER. And that really goes into why we wound up with a repository. Um, so for our results, I mean, they are pretty loud and clear. If you want to check out our uh, Affordable Learning Georgia statistics, just go right to our site and click on Statistics Research and Reports. I will directly link you to them right here. Um, I won't go into too much detail over numbers because I got to keep going. So we had a really good grant program going. We were reducing the time or reducing the amount of time faculty needed by paying for a course release. But without a repository, we realized that even though this was an adoption focused effort, faculty were creating resources left and right and we were funding it with state funds. These needed to be at least publicly available open access and we really wanted them to be uh, to be open educational resources, we wanted them to be licensed. So they had to find their own way at first. Uh, they used our low content builder, OER Commons, LibGuides, and a few others that you might not think of when you think of OER. Curriki, for example, is usually K-12, but we used it also for uh, higher ed at that point. So it was a bit messy and we couldn't require things like a Creative Commons attribution license on things if we weren't giving them the tools in order to do so. So we didn't have enough staff to do USG Share again. So what we did was uh, we looked at different uh, platforms and different vendors. We decided on a B-Press repository. Um, we decided on that because it was hosted in the cloud um, and the vendor is maintaining the platform itself. So we weren't having to go into the servers and do some PHP work the way that you may have to do when you're in DSpace. Um, I am the only one doing metadata and uploading at the moment. We're hoping to improve that workflow at some point. Um, and it's limited to ALG funded and created resources due to the scale of this project. So there is a level of uh, curation and um, at least authority in, in a library term of authorship being that all of these are USG funded resources. We're open to expanding this to faculty authors, but it would require some additional staff. There have been over 60,000 downloads of all of our materials and there are only about 180 materials in the repository and we launched this last October. So we are super excited about that and you can see that it's going worldwide too. And that's because search, uh, search engine optimization is key. Google's our largest refer. Um, Google in the Philippines is number two. The Open Textbook Library, thank goodness for them, is number three. Um, if faculty are submitting materials on their own, we're going to need to have an advanced template that goes beyond just the metadata fields that we have. Um, we are already repurposing what used to be for journal articles for open textbooks and ancillaries. Um, so going beyond that, it's gonna be uh, pretty careful work. And we also learned that titles really matter. Um, some of the titles that uh, were put onto some of our open textbooks seem to just grab people's attention on search engines more than others. So we're carefully watching the B-Press acquisition by Elsevier. Um, that is one thing that we have to do when we're looking ahead on this repository. Um, we want to see if we can open up this repository uh, to submissions by all USG instructors while still maintaining uh, a level of authority and consistency. Um, and of course, increasing the visibility beyond just search engine optimization. We hope that in Georgia, people will find this not just through Google, but also through um, different university system of Georgia sites. So that is a little bit about Galileo Open Learning Materials, which is our repository. Um, I am going to link you to the front page of it right now. And I wanted to make sure that I had five minutes for Q&A and I have done exactly that. So uh, please feel free to ask questions. So Jeff, I have a couple of questions. This is Quill. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, and my first is actually what kind of advice would you offer for colleges or organizations or core consortium who are looking for ways to make it possible for faculty to share their work based on your history? What should we people be thinking about? Um, in order to enable faculty to share their work, you're saying? Yes. Okay, well, first of all, it, it, you have to build the repository with the idea of, or at least build this side of your repository with the idea of this is here for open educational resources. Um, if they wind up with things talking about volumes and issues or, you know, we've slightly changed what it is or put it in a parenthesis or something like that, it just won't work out. You'll get weird types of metadata that really won't map up. Um, luckily, we've been, we were able to work with BPress on this uh, to get some good Dublin Core fields that align themselves with these fields that we've got. But if you can, for example, bake Creative Commons licenses right in. So you can select the Creative Commons license that you want to put on this resource. That takes so much of the work um, in setting that Creative Commons license from these faculty members, where they usually think, oh, this is a big long process with legal agreements and things like that. Well, no, you just select it here. We link them out to exactly where that license is. Like building the repository for that is great. I think that that's, that's the first step. Um, making everything visible in different ways, yeah. Um, We've got Paige Wolf saying, will you eventually be adding the Georgia Technical Colleges as textbook creators? Um, due to how the University System of Georgia funding works within Affordable Learning Georgia, uh, we can't be dispersing funds to the technical college system at the moment. Um, but deals that would be far above my pay grade may make that happen in the future. I, I would hope. I, I would love to have as many uh, faculty authors in Georgia helping to create uh, resources across the state. I, absolutely. And did you see Jennifer's question? Um, there is what we are seeing on this page, the BPress platform. Oh, um, if you went to oer.galileo.usg.edu, um, that is, ah, okay. So uh, Barbara Olowski has a solution for Paige. Um, I wonder about uh, and also, so the BPress platform, yes, this is something like what you would see in a BPress Digital Commons repository. We took quite a bit of liberty with uh, the browsing fields, the search fields, just about everything on this page we've changed, in ter except for like where the iframes are and how they're designed. So we've heavily customized this for open textbooks, ancillaries, and our grant reports. Okay, um, and how are we doing for other questions for Jeff? And we can cycle back at the end of the webinar as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I will give up remote control. There you go. It's always fun to get your cursor back. <laughs> okay, so um, our next producer, or next, uh, let's try that again. Our, our next presenter is Barbara Olowski, who was a founding member of CCC OER uh, and co-authored one of the first OER textbooks, Collaborative Statistics. Uh, Barbara has been a longtime advocate for open education and is currently serving as a board member for our parent organization, the Open Education Consortium. Uh, in her current role as Chief Academic Affairs Officer for the California Community College's Online Education Initiative, she is helping to grow uh, the use of OER throughout the state of California, uh, and today she's going to tell us about one part of the work they've done in that initiative to help us all in our open education adoption efforts. Okay, Barbara, thank you. Well, thanks everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I have I'm talking today about, oops, this thing is going on by itself again. Ooh, I'm sorry, that's me actually trying to mute myself. Oh, okay. Could we go back to my first slide then? Let's see if I can... Go back. Okay. So I, um, 
you're going to have all these slides, but everything that I'm talking about, you can get to from ccconeled.org. So just so you, you have that, I'm going to be talking about a really exciting project that a team of us are, have been working on for the past few months. And in California, there are, two, there are three parts to this project, actually. The first is getting an OER website up on the um, the online ed site, and we just went live with that just last week. And I know on this call, um, I know that Logan Murray is on this Zoom meeting, who was really instrumental in doing the brunt of the work, and Liesl Madrana, who also assisted with it. On this area, we have tools and resources that are going out to both state and national pieces of information, guidelines and research, which goes again to state and national, zero textbook cost degrees and a large FAQ. We've also linked to some of the major, uh, major repositories that are peer reviewed. We, I, the other part that I wanna to talk to you about is the online education initiative. And we have a online rubric that was developed by faculty across the state of California. And in this online rubric, it's about effective practices for online teaching. There are several uh, similar types of rubrics that are out there. Quality Matters is a well-known one, one from OLC, and this is the one that the California Community Colleges faculty adopted. If you want to follow on Twitter for the CCC OEI, there's the Twitter handle right there, and mine is down below, and it's Dr. BSI, my initials. Thanks. The next thing I just like to point out to you who's been working on this project. This was a grassroots effort that came to me from Cyrus Health at West LA, Antonio Lopez from Sacramento City College, and Bruce Center from Sac City College. And because I've I know them and have been working around the state. They said, hey, you know, here's something that we really want to do. And could we get organized? And we had a great meeting. And here's the team who's been working on it. And I'm very appreciative of all the, the hard work that everybody has done to make such a terrific project. So just to give you a little idea about the online education initiative, our idea behind this, this initiative was from the legislature. And it um, was really had two parts. One is on proving quality to online courses and improving quality for, for instruction and for student learning, adding academic support, student services support. And the other part was on building an exchange so that students at one community college could easily take a course at another community college if they needed something to finish their, their degree or their certificate. They always could, but, the, but before, you would have to apply to the other college, do your assessment test there, do a whole, new, um, a whole new ed plan, when really maybe all you really needed was to, um, to take one or two courses. So one of the first things we did was we did a statewide, had a statewide committee searching for a common course management system because we felt that if we were going to be providing professional development and support, and students taking courses at various colleges, it was important to have one course management system that all the students or most of the students would be using as opposed to the four commercial ones mostly that the colleges had and a whole bunch of homegrown systems plus a lot of publisher sort of uh, websites and so on. So we chose Canvas as a common course management system. And at this point, 111 of the 114 colleges have switched to it. We, we did provide an incentive to help the colleges make that decision to switch in that we would pay for Canvas for them and they would no longer need to pay for their, their current um, learning management system. And then we built in a lot of support services that you can see. Um, and these are support services that some are commercial, such as online tutoring um, or proctoring. Some are homegrown and some are just coordination that we did. Well, what we want to do for 2018, at least on the academic side, and I'm leading the academic side, is really look at how can we do more in accreditation support for colleges with online programs, more in data analytics, 
um, having more of a social presence, credit for prior learning, and this goes from both military, um, military returning veterans and uh, workforce. And open educational resources were always throughout, but we really just got the push when um, Cyrus and Antonio came to me and said, hey, can we really get started on this? So that moved it into, back into 2017. And what else would be really, would really um, uh, be helpful? And I see one note in here from Ali, the navigation from faculty resources page isn't up, it takes you to effective practices. Well, fortunately for us, we have Logan Murray in this meeting, and so Logan will make that note, and I bet by the time that the, this afternoon, that will be fixed, so thanks. Thanks very much. Any other uh, edits that you see, please let us know, because we just released the site last week, and I'm sure that we have a lot. You can get this rubric from the first original URL that I put up, but if you want to go directly, this is the course design rubric. It's designed to help faculty with a self-check, but it's, and it's also designed so that um, when the courses are submitted to either their own instructional design support check or the online ed initiative, you can see what's, what's needing some more assistance. So for example, one of our challenging areas is in um, accessibility. A lot of faculty know that accessibility is important, but they may not know how to make accessible tables or accessible PowerPoints or, or other pieces. Okay, so now back to why I was asked to speak here today. We got a group together and Cyrus was starting to do this and we decided just to make this hugely massive. I, I'm often will take a simple project and make it so complicated that it, it, <laughs> it becomes of more interest to me and has a lot more bells and whistles in it. And so what Cyrus was doing was taking some of the OpenStax textbooks and making them into, uh, or embedding them into a Canvas course shell, adding in the PowerPoints and adding in the test banks. And when that was how I started to learn about this. Um, oh yeah, I'm really sorry about the background noise. I'm gonna keep the mic close to me. I'm not sure how to mute the background noise and, and keep it, um, you hearing me because I actually am um, at a hotel here. And Logan seems to be, seems that he's actually fixed what Ollie pointed out, so terrific. So when Cyrus came to me, what we, we worked with, and I worked with, um, Helen Graves and Liesl Madrana from the Online Ed Initiative and said, how about if we take what Cyrus is starting with and we develop an entire course shell that's actually aligned to the OEI course design rubric, and that way any faculty member who's either starting to teach online or maybe doesn't know about online pedagogy or could use some assistance would have this information as, as a way to get started. And because these are aligned to the rubric already, we know that they follow effective uh, pedagogy and accessibility. And everything that we're doing is in this is WCAG 2.0 AA compliance. So um, that was one of our main parts. So we started with information for faculty. And um, yes, so Una said we started with the OpenStix psychology textbook, that's right. And I will just tell you, we're making the shells for all of the open tech, OpenStax textbooks. We have 10 of them already completed. But we started with psychology, and that's why that's on the screenshots. And, and by we, I mean, I didn't actually do the hard work. It was the team that did all the work. But I'm using the collective we in this part. And um, we did a page for instructors. So Faculty could choose, and, and I want to let you know that everything in here is um, an example or a sample, and faculty are able to choose what they want and delete what they want and edit what they want. And so we had two different landing pages, what I would consider the friendly landing page, which is warm and welcoming. And then for people who don't want to be warm and welcoming and just want to get their stuff up, there's an alternative front page. We have instruction, instructions for instructors on how to use the sample course shell, um, what if you want to put in your own content, resources, uh, 
knowing how long the total total reading time is for each item and and so on and I just received an email from Trenton in San Diego just yesterday saying I was looking for a video on how to use the course shell so now I'm thinking okay up next I suggested to him maybe he would want to make a video and we could include it in our in our course shell so for example here's information for faculty on the textbook and because we're using all OER books we um, have the information and in here Nicole Woolley who's a librarian at Sac City and working on the online ed initiative did all of the links to the open stacks with the ISBN and the various ways that you can get the textbook down below we have information for faculty again you can keep it or you can get rid of it so in yellow this this says to faculty link to your own colleges DSPS website well many faculty might not have thought of even doing that and by having that they're like oh I can go find that out or link to your college's handbook course catalog or your academic honesty policy which they may not have thought about doing and other things again remember all of this is for um, is optional so how to record your welcome video well I personally always send out a welcome video and I put it both inside the course shell and I also send it as an email attachment to my students two weeks before the course starts other faculty might not have thought about making a welcome video some faculty do just a, a um, uh, just a uh, text information but if you want to record a welcome video or you hadn't even thought about it here's information how to do it and also information about how to caption getting started this is information for students then in here as well uh, and then we have information for students on how to be successful many of these link back to canvas videos and canvas information how to update your canvas profile how to do an introduction and of course we have samples in here on how to do this and then links for student support services and online learning this, these are areas where we encourage faculty to link back to their campus um, sites there's also ways that you can link to um, uh, canvas sites and other information here and now the part that we actually we actually did again by we meaning I did none of this but on this part Cyrus health from West Los Angeles College he took the OpenStax tech um, textbook which is uh, WCAG 2.0 AA compliant the PowerPoints which were many of the PowerPoints were actually um, submitted or started by community members and they weren't produced by OpenStax although some of them were produced by OpenStax and so, same with the test banks so now OpenStax is going through and making the PowerPoints and test banks um, accessible WCAG 2.0 and as they're being done we're, we're incorporating them so for example the psychology PowerPoints are accessible and so we've um, Cyrus has included them in from in here their test bank for psychology is accessible and so he has a guide for faculty on how to edit quizzes if you want to use the quizzes um, what you can do how you can do open edit quizzes and so then as a student would go in again they might be linking outside to the course but they also have it directly embedded in here here's the text for the start of the psychology the the reason that we decided to do this is one um, it came from a request from a psychology professor at at West LA to Cyrus like could you help me do this it also came from faculty who have said along the way of course I want to use OER of course I want to save students money of course I like the idea of academic freedom but let's just face it it's too hard to switch over when I'm already doing so much stuff and I don't know what textbooks open textbooks are good and I also don't know how to get started doing all my switches and the commercial publishers have a lot of support content for me that I really want like test banks and PowerPoints and so that's how we started with this project everything that we're doing 
is Creative Commons attributions licensed. We've put them into Canvas Commons with um, as a cartridge so that anybody can go and import them into your own instance of Canvas. If you don't have a Canvas shell, you can go onto canvas.org or canvas.com, I forgot which it is, and you can create a free account for it. We now have 11 course shells up out of a total of 29. And we're really excited about this. I want to just point out the one shell that you see first here. And this is a screenshot from Canvas Commons. You'll see Canvas Sample Core Shell. That one does not have an OER text or any text in it. Oh, and so, for example, in the psychology, sociology, and all the other ones, not only are the OpenStax texts embedded it, but we've embedded general course descriptions. And for those of you who are from the California Community College system, what we did was we embedded the CID course description, which is from the California State University system. Um, and that's for the CID designated courses. For other courses that don't have that, for example, astronomy, we just put in a general course description from a course catalog. And for all of these, we've said, okay, you can take this out, change it to your own course description and put it in. But for the, the Canvas sample course shell, that one's empty. That's if you're not teaching with one of the OpenStax books, maybe you're using another OER, um, textbook, or maybe even you're using, and I'll even say it here, a commercial textbook, you can still go and use the Canvas course shell because this will provide information on making a, um, a, a, a course that's aligned with the Online Education Initiatives course design rubric. So what's next? Well, that actually was the, the number that was needed when up until yesterday and then because of the incredible all-day work of Nicole Woolley we actually have um, we actually have now only 18 more to go just to start we're putting them all in Canvas Commons so that anybody can download them. And you'll see if you go into them and you import them, I asked to give attribution to the California Community College's Chancellor's Office. And that's because they are the ones funding the Online Education Initiative Grant. Uh, there is a Canvas community that you can have discussions. Here's what we need and here's where you could help us. Um, we started with the OpenStax books because they are the furthest along. They fit the needs of pretty much the top 50 highest enrolled courses in the California Community College system. So we knew that that would provide a lot of resource. But what we don't, and we knew they were accessible. And uh, no, oh no, we took the we took the top 50 courses from Cool for Ed, and we chose the ones that had a, an OpenStax book that was included with them, which came to be uh, about, uh, uh, and were CID designated. So yeah, maybe that was 25, but then we added the developmental math courses to it. Um, what we really need are course shells for career technical ed courses, basic skills, ESL, and other open textbooks. So what I'm hoping is that if you have an initiative, um, like maybe Jeff says, oh, we have this book, this book, this book that we've done. If, if you are using Canvas and you want to, share, to use the shell, it would, you're not required to because, again, we have a Creative Commons attributions license, but it would be delightful if you would like to then upload your course back into Canvas Commons so that others could find it. And if you put a tag of OER, um, more people will be able to find it. Everything that, that we've done, we're we have 10 tags on them. OER is one of the tags. And also CCC and OEI are a tag. Now, what else can you offer? Um, I wanted, I've been asked to include this this um, disclaimer on all 
parts that we, um, when we present, and this, the disclaimer says that we are not endorsing OpenStax as the only provider of open educational resources texts. We, uh, we're starting with them because we know that they're so far ahead. They're widely accepted. Uh, in California, the Cal State University system um, accepts the OpenStax and the articulation agreements, and CSU is actually the second largest user of OpenStax. So it was a good support for, for California. However, we know that there are plenty of other repositories and open textbooks that are out there. The other part was I knew that the OpenStax textbooks were accessible, WCAG 2.0, AA compliant, so I wasn't going to need to spend time running work on that. But I'd love to know if others have suggestions. Um, we really want to make this useful for the community. We want to make this so that other people will upload their shells um, so career technical education for other courses and that it would be a way to to help everybody and let's see is that all I have oh that's it that's mine oh I also want to point out one other thing part of the reason that um, I think so many of us involved but just to state it in case people don't have it down there is this is really a social justice issue it's important that students have access to their course content on day one of the course and if this is a way that we can help making sure that students have access on day one regardless of their socioeconomic status regardless of whether they're on financial aid it's it helps to improve the course success and retention and there is a lot of research out there BYU um, Research Hub has a lot of information. Okay, I'm going to now uh, give up remote control, which is a tough thing for me to do. The question from Bruce was, can out-of-state faculty access the Canvas OpenStax shells? Absolutely, we put them into Canvas Commons with a Creative Commons attribution license. There are many tags that you can use but if you really want to find the the 11 that we have right now um, I'm going to put the tag I would suggest so do it separately because that would then do CCC for California Community Colleges which you're going to get so many people's other things and OEI and when you do them you get um, almost the top 11 popping up as your top 11 with maybe just others so for folks who aren't familiar, um, Canvas is learning If you don't have an institution that's using Canvas, or you can't And that makes it possible to get into Canvas Commons and see the courses. You can actually bring the whole thing into your own course and see what they look like and kind of play around with them a little bit. Um, so it's a, it's, a, um, it, it's a repository in a way, but it's making use of the software that um, California already has available to it across the state, which is a good resources rather than um, thinking about it. Um, be on. Um, and one of the things that I was Particularly interested in more of this, um, for this webinar is your see some other open textbooks um, that are out there because we're at a spot where we've got some really good things a lot you know many that are homegrown some that are mixtures um, but that are out there and we are not quite sure what to do with them so I didn't know I mean I know OER Commons is out there I know OpenStax CNX I know you know even the open textbook library you know where are some places that people would go to look and now and now this uh, CCC Canvas community um, that are out there without us having to create our own repository, which I suppose we could do, but sure. people wouldn't know to look for us. So I'll also give you one one other 
option is on the, and Una can put this in, Unaletta project, and the website as a result of that project is coolfored.org, and it's connected with Merlot, and Dr. Hanley, who is in charge of Merlot from California State University, just added the um, TACT Grant Skills Commons site could go for uh, open textbooks, but you also now have with Skills Commons that you can upload information there. The career courses have been a really hard challenge in my mind for finding repositories. It's not as organized with, um, because they don't go to the four-year schools. Some of the colleges have some information. BC Campus, if you go to their site, they have their own information on career technical, and it's called core courses and not to be confused as I was confused with core for K through 12. Core, the core courses are their career ones. But Paige, if you're using or if you want to use uh, Canvas and you just input all your information there and upload it again, then that would be a place where you could, you, it could be seen and visible. And if you do some of the tags, um, that we have. Maybe you even want to use OEI as a tag for the online ed initiative as well as OER. People will find it. And, and that's one thing that has been really been very common is it's a place where people can go and find information. Thank you. Yeah, so we had um, quite a few different ways of getting things out there when we didn't have a repository. And you'll see on, a, on the slide kind of a list of them. The biggest uh, disadvantage to going out there and finding something else is that they are often, if they're free to use, uh, restricted in terms of file size limit. So Merlot Content Builder is great for that, so is OER Commons. I would suggest OER Commons to start out with because it's a very WordPress-like uh, content builder, and it also contains a lot of uh, fields for metadata that would allow people to browse themselves to your work or find it uh, through searching very easily. Um, and yeah, uh, so other than that, um, CNX was mentioned and it functions in a way that you kind of need to know some XML and the uh, kind of version of it within CNX as XML is extensible and they extended it. Um, but yeah, a, a great starting point I would say is OER Commons. But if you're finding that file size limits are a big problem, that may be the point in which you need to um, find a cloud hosting solution or start your own repository. I think also I just want to put out there to draw attention to your materials. The CCC OER listserv is a great place to just remind people that they're out there. Um, sometimes we're not looking for something, but when somebody hands it to us, we suddenly need it really badly. Oh yeah, and Una mentioned Regina Gong. Um, she has been extremely helpful in getting OER programs together um, at community colleges too. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, this is Una. I just wanted to mention that Regina is in Michigan, so she's been part of that program that Michigan Colleges Online um, has been, has been um, they created about a year ago. Uh, Rhonda Edwards actually runs the program, um, and Rhonda is a member, but um, she doesn't have, uh, she doesn't participate as much in our uh, email list, but you may know Regina, so thank you. So we will keep entertaining questions in the chat window, but I want to move forward just because I'm being uh, aware of our time and timing. And I want to make sure that everybody knows we have another webinar coming up on November 15th on equity and diversity. And this is a big issue in open education right now, discussing what we mean by equity and diversity and what OER really does to support that as a social justice issue. So please join us. I think it's going to be a great webinar. Um, and it looks, um, thank you, Una, for reminding us. We will have additional speakers. Um, 
So those will be announced soon. Uh, keep an eye on our blog and our updates. Uh, and we have some upcoming conferences. So CCC OER will be at Dream in February. Um, Open Ed Global will be in Delft, the Netherlands this year, um, and that's coming up in April. So we keep a list of conferences that we know um, we're going to or that we hope our members are going to or that we've heard members are going to in hopes that people will try to meet up with each other face to face. Uh, we do that under Get Involved on our website. So um, please check that spot and if you know you're going to be at a conference and you think other open people might want to be there or might be there, please get in contact with us and let us know. Um, there's um, that's a way for us to kind of make sure our members know how to see each other face to face. Um, <laughs> um, and of course, stay on our community email list if you're not there already. And there's a way to join that on our website. Um, our website's kind of your best tool. Um, so now I think we're, we have like three minutes left. If there's any other questions on the topic or questions about CCCOER, we would be happy to answer them right now. Um, it looks like our first question, oh look, it's Una's already answered, but our um, November 15th webinar will be at 11 a.m. Pacific time and 2 p.m. Eastern time. We try to keep our webinars at the same time, um, just on different days so that we can keep track and get on your regular schedule. Um, and, oh, that is very good news that OE Global just extended their proposal deadline because I'm late with mine. <laughs> um, are there any other questions or comments for the good of the team? Um, I wanted to say one last thing. We've been sending out surveys for the, um, last couple of months after our uh, webinars. And we do appreciate hearing from you about other topics. I think we heard a couple of topics here right at the end that we might consider for the spring semester. So please fill out those surveys if you get a chance and, and let us know uh, how the webinar went for you today and what you might like to see in the future. And I want to thank all of you for attending. These webinars are always really um, fun for me. So I'm really glad when people come because we can keep doing them. I really want to thank both Jeff and Barbara for their time and for getting on board with this somewhat difficult to talk about um, presentation because it was kind of technical, but not. And they made it very elegant. So thank you. Um, and thanks to all of you. And I hope you're having a wonderful day.